Thanks, everyone, for coming and for making such a good turnout. Um, now, the purpose of this event is really a sort of experiment in arts, sciences, collaboration. I'm um, trying to bring together two fields, which I think are very complementary and quite dynamic at the moment, around a set of common interests. The first of these is the history of paleontology as it's being conducted in arts and humanities um, departments and fields, which I think has grown very sort of tremendously over the past few years into quite a dynamic field, um, looking at the development of the public role and the impact of paleontological ideas across quite a long time frame, moving really from the late 18th century almost up until the present. And this field's developed in a very, very interdisciplinary sort of way. So it has a kind of regular home in the history of science, but then there are also people working at the history of paleontology from art history perspectives, from English perspectives, from cultural studies perspectives, and so on. So it's a field which is really mixing together all of these different humanities approaches. But then, of course, we also have um, paleontology and science communication itself, which is incredibly prominent in the media, in the public domain, um, and it's currently doing a lot of really, really innovative stuff, I think, um, both in terms of conventional media like um, television programs and newspaper reports, but also um, particularly in online formats like blogs, podcasts, and bigger projects around these. So these are two areas which I think are very potentially complementary and synergistic. And while there's been quite a lot of informal contacts between um, arts and humanities people interested in these things and, and, and working scientists, um, in terms of actual events and actual formal activities, there hasn't been very much. The main things I can think about have been the two um, dinosaur-related conferences in, Lo in London and in Paris in, in 2008 and 2011. Um, so um, we're going to be linking across these two days these two complementary areas um, around the issue of popularization or sort of public engagement. So thinking about the kind of crucial role that public debates, public conceptions and so on have played in the formation of paleontological ideas and also the impact that paleontology and ideas of deep time evolution have had on public conceptions and wider ways of thinking about not just the Earth's deep history, but on nature, the environment, and, and, and so on. Um, so, yeah, and, and so um, in, a, in a period that which we're in now, where speaking to public audiences and public engagement and sort of impact have become increasingly important things that researchers in all different fields are doing, that I think linking together across disciplinary fields and talking about how we do these things, how we think about these things, is quite a productive um, way of, 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 of sort of organising events. Um, so as a way of kind of setting up context, I'm going to give kind of brief characterizations of these two sort of areas as, as from my sort of perspective. Um, to start with, in terms of the history of paleontology, in terms of what it's traditionally focused on over the past 20 or 30 years, has historically kind of devoted the bulk of its attention to the 19th century and to the Victorian period. Um, looking at the formative um, period of the discipline, often great sort of figures like George Cuvier or William Buckland, but also kind of people who've been written out of a lot of the um, conventional literature, so Mary Anning or Hugh Miller and people like this. And really looking at how ideas of fossil extinct animals, on the one hand dinosaurs, but also marine reptiles, mammoths, twilight and ammonites and so on, are depicted to public audiences and really have a major destabilizing effect on the way in which people conceptualize the world and conceptualize long trajectories of development. And there is often a point made in a lot of this literature that this establishment of the Earth's deep history has been, was um, as big a conceptual break as um, Darwinian evolution um, was in, in the middle of the century. So really driving home the importance of these developments. And so there have been a series of really good books which have been produced on this. So Martin Rudwick, um, really, I think, set the ball running in the, um, in, in, in the early 80s with books like Scenes from Deep Time and the Great Devonian contra Controversy, looking at how these issues are both promoted to public audiences through things like paleo art, but also how they're discussed in scientific contexts like ge geological societies and the wider media. Um, and more recently, we've had um, Ralph O'Connor's The Earth on Show, which is a really, really great book which looks at how not only does paleontology and geology develop as subjects which are fundamentally dependent on presenting things to the public, but the way in which they write, the way in which they express themselves, also derives from Victorian literary, literary traditions and Victorian artistic conventions. 
So that's the sort of area that, that we now know quite a lot about. Um, in terms of where the bulk of research at the moment is, doing, uh, um, is going, it's really moving into the 1890 to 1930 period, and this is kind of quite reflective of a lot of the talks and a lot of the topics that we're um, having over the next few days. And this is obviously a really, really significant time for the discipline. It's when you get the growth of really, really massive museum collections. It's when America becomes a scientific sort of superpower, first of um, in, in paleontology, um, particularly for us, but also in a whole range of other disciplines. And where things like large, spectacular dinosaurs really are presented very, very prominently and very, very dramatically to, science, to, 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 to public audiences through the media and through things like mass production newspapers, through films, and all sorts of new um, kind of communicative technologies. So in this sort of area, there's been quite a lot of work about, um, say, how paleontology develops as a sort of interdisciplinary or across, um, across approach sort of field. So lots of work's been done on Charles R. Knight and um, early, uh, early 20th century paleo artists in terms of their relationships with working scientists and in terms of their own scientific practices, and who actually has authority to interpret and depict paleontological creatures. But also a lot of this work is moving beyond a kind of Euro-American focus to look at how paleontology expands into regions beyond Europe and gets associated with kind of early 20th century globalization, but also things like um, colonialism and the expansion of European control overseas. So here we have an image of the excavations in Pendaguru where we have um, some people um, from the Museum of Fernand Hilton in Berlin working um, on at the moment, which is a huge, huge um, excavation project in the German colony, colony in East Africa, which brings back the remains of very, very spectacular dinosaurs to Europe. Um, in terms of the kind of later period, in terms of the kind of 1930 to 2000, there's relatively little actually being produced at the moment from a history of science or a, or a, or a kind of uh, humanities perspective, despite this being a very, very important period, both for the promotion of paleontological ideas in the public domain and for the discipline itself. So we have, for example, big dramatic films. So we have the right of spring sequence from Dizzy Fantasia in 1940, or we have Jurassic Park in the 90s. We have a whole range of television productions. Um, I put Christopher Reeve Dinosaur um, from 1985 down, because that was one of my VHSs from when I was a kid that I kind of wore out, um, watching over and over again. But also in terms of the, also in the, not just in terms of the connection with these new media technologies, but in terms of the discipline itself, where we have re-evaluations in paleoanthropology from the 1960s, when we have the dinosaur renaissance, and then we have all sorts of developments around genetics and around statistics. And looking at the dynamics of this, I think, is a really, really important area for future research. And there's been a bit on this period. So there's been um, Ace Acosti's rereading the fossil record, which has been about the growth of a paleobiological perspective in the 50s and 60s and is also quite notable for being one of the few history of paleontology works which actually looks at invertebrates rather than big charismatic um, vertebrate paleontology. Um, and there's also, to put things in a more global and a more kind of um, human evolution perspective, there's a really, really good book by Sigrid Schmelzer called The People's Peaking Man, which is about the role of paleoanthropology in China from the 50s up until the present and how this develops as a very, very public, very popular science, but occurring in, obviously, a very, very distinct context un under a communist system. Then if we sort of move into the present, then really, if you look at the current media, quite often you cannot move for stories about paleontology and dinosaurs in particular. So um, this is just to say the Guardian's series of, from, from its kind of dinosaur section from July. And there are sort of eight stories um, on some kind of dinosaur-related topic, and this isn't even kind of take into account all the stories in other evolutionary or geological or paleontological um, fields. So, um, yeah, so this is at least two stories a week, which is a lot by, I, I think, a, a, a media standard, and definitely in terms of science news reporting. And even, I think, in terms of some countries, you'll struggle to find two stories a week um, in, 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 in the current print media. And from my sort of outsider point of view, it, do, it does look like it's increasingly the sort of practice within paleontology that whenever an important research paper is published in a scientific journal, it's accompanied by a press release, by a piece of paleo art, and by some attempt to feed into this media interest. And so I'm, I'm quite interested in hearing from the paleontologists about how this actually works and the kind of challenges and difficulties um, around this. As well as this, we get kind of quite high profile um, television production, productions of both a factual nature and a more popular nature. But this is sort of, again, really, really within our current media landscape around us. 
But then in terms of what's actually being done in paleontology itself, I think there's a lot of really, really interesting stuff that's being presented, often at quite a high scientific level, um, engaging uh, and, and getting feedback from public audiences, and also very often informed by the history of the discipline in quite important ways, which I think is, again, another reason why this is a good um, sort of area to link together historians and scientists, because um, there are these definite synergies and kind of um, and, and links between them. So we have, say, Brian Swihead's work, which is um, a kind of a combination of um, conventional printed textbooks, but also a very, very successful and very um, widely produced um, blog. Um, there's the Trailblazers project, which is an attempt to sort of recover the lost um, female contributors to paleontology, geology, and archaeology, which have been very, very important for developing the discipline um, and different approaches throughout history. And then we have sort of um, things like the Lime Ranges Fossil Festival, which are aimed at public audiences, but which are taking advantage of the historical roots around the location. And then sort of very, very active and really, really interesting podcasts like Paleocast and the Ted Zoo podcast, which I'm very, very happy to have participants from today, which I think are really, really um, interesting in showing how these new forms of public engagement can operate. And I, I do actually think that in terms of public engagement in science, and some of the most interesting stuff is occurring in paleontology um, at, at, at the moment. So that's really the kind of, my, my, my kind of survey and my kind of impression of, of the overview. Um, and I think that there is a sort of continuum through these humanities approaches to the way in which these things are done nowadays, which is gonna form the basis for a lot of our discussions um, over the next couple of days. And in terms of how we can sort of approach these issues and these links, I've got a few kind of quickly brainstormed down here on different levels that we can talk about these things. Um, on the one hand, we can talk about theories and concepts of science communication, so what exactly does it mean to popularise or to engage the public? What exactly is going on here in a kind of social and in a kind of cultural manner? So we can look on that kind of more abstract level. We can draw direct comparisons and links between the past and present approaches in terms of how the past informs current ideas or how the past is quite weird and distinct and separate from current ideas. Um, and we can also sort of discuss and maybe work out future, future ways of doing um, kind of practical examples of um, links between paleontology um, and the public and public engagement programs. So that's sort of the kind of background. Um, we've got a bit of time. I, I was actually told off at one event that I organised for not talking enough about myself and my own sort of perspective. So what I'm going to be talking about now is really my take of these issues and the current sort of project which I'm working on. Um, in terms of my background, I'm a historian by training, and a lot of my earlier work was on the history of ideas of race and human diversity and human evolution. So I'm very, very, I was also very, very interested in the relationships between science, between politics, between culture, and how these things all get um, entangled. But I developed this project, which I've given the sort of title The Lost Beasts International Paleontology and the Evolution of the Mammals, um, 1880 to 1950, um, as a way of taking these sort of interests back into the further geological past and into a more kind of wider global sort of um, perspective. And this project sort of developed when I was a research assistant in the University of Bristol, where I was, I was officially working within a, um, a kind, of, kind of China studies history unit, looking at the history of Western expeditions to um, China in the early 20th century. But I discovered when I was there that um, Bristol had a very, very active and a very dynamic um, paleontology department. So I sat in on Mike Denton's Virgo paleontology course, and it was really, really exciting and really, really interesting. So getting to grips with both of these two things was, of course, really important for the development of this project. And the sort of aim of this um, is really to think about um, a variety of questions on how paleontology can show us different things about modern science. So some of these are on quite a um, history of science um, as a sort of level, so looking at how it develops as an international discipline in which builds together different disciplinary approaches. I'm very interested in non-Darwinian evolutionary theories and the kind of odd ways of thinking about progressive and degenerational um, development um, at this time. But I'm also really interested in how sort of fossil mammals are presented to public audiences um, in this period, what kind of meanings are given to them, um, and um, how they really affect people's understandings of nature, of the environment, 
of evolution and animals in general, how this discovering a sort of deep evolutionary history of horses, of um, whales, of proboscideans, or learning about fossil mammals which are now extinct and which have now disappeared, so like Titanopheus ground fossils and so on. How does this condition the way in which people in this period um, understand the world around them? And also, how do the stereotypes and the ideas which are developed in this period, which are very much around sort of um, preservation of biodiversity on the one hand, but also progress and efficiency in the natural world. How do these affect current concepts of um, nature and the environment? So the end product of this is going to be a really, really massive book, which is going to be produced um, yeah, in the next two years, hopefully. But I've done a couple of sort of more experimental articles looking at different elements of this. So, for example, I've been very interested in this, which are, which are the first ever animatronic dinosaurs, which were widely presented in the mid-1920s by a US model-making company called Messmore and Damon. Um, and on the one hand, these are really, really kind of schlocky sort of things. This is a um, report from a Broadway show where the dinosaur is sent to eat a woman on stage and take it away. Um, and there's and they're displayed in department stores and all kinds of um, popular media. But then, if you look a bit more in depth at the construction of this thing, the people that the Massimo Dane and the company make this are in contact with scientists at the American Museum of Natural History. They're getting them to endorse the reproductions, and they find they can't really push the kind of sensationalist elements too hard, or the public becomes quite annoyed and quite um, and, and, and quite dismissive. So this, um, the, 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 the mechanical dinosaur eating the caveman, is is absolutely panned because obviously the Brontosaurus is a vegetarian. And um, everyone knows that in, in the 1920s, the dinosaurs and cave people didn't live together. So um, this sort of thing, it, 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 it shows that, that we have this kind of uh, re reinforcing and, and, and kind of circulatory set of, set of issues going on. The other sort of thing, and this is a bit meta, this is a kind of popular article on science popularization, um, is an article which I did to History Today relatively recently on the impact that the discovery of Pleistocene animals in Victorian London had on conceptualizations of both building in the modern city, but also evolution and development, and animals in general, because this is a period where while you're getting mass building in Trafalgar Square on the Strand outside us, um, and uh, which is churning, churning up lots of the remains of Pleistocene animals, which need to be kind of understood that this was once an area where we had these dramatic creatures. This is occurring at exactly the same time when people, when public audiences in London are also seeing the first live hippos and the first um, live elephants which are being brought back. So you get this very, very sort of complicated mixture of reflecting on the modern natural world, modern animals, and the deep past of the modern city, which is going on across all of this. Um, as well as this, there's going to be a kind of more public-facing element to it. So there's going to be a kind of supporting online exhibition, which I'm kind of putting together at the moment. And the idea is that this is going to sort of support the construction of the book. So it's going to be a place where I can kind of have the public-facing element of my research. And it's also going to be somewhere where um, my, my, my kind of contextual information, where my notes and where my sort of general thoughts can, can, can be presented. Um, so it's going to be an online exhibition with four different segments. So you can learn about animals, so say late 19th century conceptions of the dinosaurus and what that kind of implies about contemporary ideas of nature. You can learn about ancient concepts, so all about orthogenesis or um, 19th century ideas of extinction. You can learn about historical methods um, of preservation, mounting, and construction, and so on. Or you can learn about different places. So you have an image of the garden that plants kind of displayed in Paris, but also places like fossil fields in South Africa you could read about, or um, major American museums, or smaller museums in the UK or Australia, and so on. So this is sort of being constructed with the aim that the academic research and the public engagement elements sort of feed into one another and become mutually reinforcing in that sort of way. Um, so that's sort of me, generally. But for our agenda then for the next sort of few days is to really sort of think about and discuss some of these issues. And some of these, uh, well, I hope all of them will be productive, but we'll see how we sort of get on. It's really to think about sort of how sort of interaction between public ideas and paleontological science works or doesn't. 
So how it can be done successfully, how it can sort of run into problems and difficulties. Um, also thinking about how current ideas and practices in paleontology have been or can be informed by past developments, so all the historical ways of looking at these things or presenting these things, and also sort of sharing ideas and methods um, in public engagement and promoting these things to public audiences in a wide variety of different factors. And this is really sort of serving as the, our kind of roadmap um, for the next few days, where we have a variety of different panels and they really move through these different areas. So we have an initial section when we talk about the bigger themes, about um, celebrity and profile in paleontology, um, about how um, scientific debates and theories become enmeshed within public discussions. Um, we then move on to a more kind of examples-based set of papers, which are also looking at how different texts are presented to public audiences. So we have one essentially on dinosaurs, thinking about why and when do dinosaurs become so dominant in paleontological understandings, or, or sorry, sorry, public understandings of paleontology. And then thinking about other organisms, how are non-dinosaurs presented to the public, when does this work, when does this doesn't, and what conditions this research. And then we have a section looking at practical examples. So um, looking at some historical examples of paleontological outreach, so either generating funds for expeditions or um, presenting textual accounts of prehistory, and then some current accounts of paleontological outreach, thinking about how some new ways of presenting paleontology to public audiences are being done at the moment. So hopefully this will give us a wide variety of things to discuss, and um, hopefully everything will be productive. So thank you.